be aware of what's being recorded. And uh, we have a Google Doc where you can follow along with the agenda and, and take notes. There'll be sections where people can be adding their notes. And if you have run into any trouble with Zoom or just want to generally have running commentary, you can use the um, Zoom chat. And if you're not speaking, we please kind of ask you to, to mute. Um, you can also face mute just because it's sometimes nice to not have to always be like, you know, <laughs> on camera. Um, and lastly, I just want to acknowledge like, you know, we are still in a pandemic and we're in mid amid uh, compounding crises, including uh, hurricanes and fires and many, many other troubling things. And people are experiencing these uh, challenges very differently. So I invite us to just be as kind and compassionate as we can be in this call and beyond. Um, so yeah, what, why are we doing these calls? Um, we hope to hear from you in a second about um, what you're hoping to get out of it. But um, a few of us were, um, I guess, thinking about <laughs> and struggling with the fact that we're living in a climate crisis. And we were also very inspired and have been a part of open movement or open movements um, for a while. And we're saying, you know, what can or should the open movement do to really respond meaningfully um, to this moment? Um, so we started a pilot series of calls that started in March and we have the, our last ones coming up next month where we basically were talking with people who were also thinking about these issues and trying to understand, yeah, what are the opportunities or some of the uh, approaches that we could think about broadly under this open climate um, idea. And if you're interested, you can read a little bit more about our past calls and conversations. There's a link in our wiki. Um, and we also tried to write an article which was framing some of the larger questions we were talking about. Um, and so one of those ideas was around a fossil-free internet. And so we have the amazing Chris Adams who will come in, in a moment and share a little bit of um, his perspective on what openness can be doing to help green the internet. But before we get to hear that good stuff, um, in the Google Doc, there's a section called introductions. And since we're a large group, we're not gonna have like everyone turn their mics on and say hello, but we would invite you to add your name, um, your email if you'd like to be in touch with us later. Um, you don't have to write your email if you don't want to. Um, and what brings you to this call? And then maybe after a few people have written, we could do just a handful of people if you wanna um, say hello and say that out loud. Um, so with I'll just go on mute for a moment and I invite you to add to the Google Doc what brings you to this call and your name. If you've already added your name, I invite you to uh, maybe check above and see if there's someone maybe cool or interesting that you're like, oh, I'd like to learn more about this person. Feel free to comment or annotate or um, just read who, who else is here in the call. Um, and in a minute, I might open the mic just to maybe hear just the voices of two or three other people. Um, it's always nice to have more than just the text. Uh, and then we'll get move into, um, into the topic of the day. Okay, so maybe if you'd like to say hello, just unmute yourself and uh, go for it. We'll just take maybe two or three people saying that.
Well, hello from Costa Rica. So good to see you beautiful people in all your respective rectangles. Hello. So we may not have that much action verbally, although I appreciate the braveness of Gunnar to say hello, but in the, uh, in the Google Doc, there's a lot happening. So a huge thanks for people putting their comments and energy in there. Um, and thank you all for being here. So I would like to turn then um, for a moment to, uh, to Chris, who's gonna share a little bit about the fossil free internet, how openness can help. And um, with no further ado, people can take notes as Chris talks in this section too, or you know, we can start to gather questions and comments, but um, Chris, welcome to the Open Climate Call. I think you're gonna share your screen and we'd love to uh, yeah. have your input. So with a bit of luck, uh, some of you folks should be able to see my screen. Um, if you can, would some of you like give some kind of affirmative, like a nod, thumbs up, excellent. That's what I wanted to see. Okay, would you, I'm just gonna put on a way so I can see the notes and see what next, pay, next slide comes up. And then if you folks are sitting comfortably, I think I'll begin. All right. Hello folks, uh, my name is Chris, uh, Chris Adams. I'm one of the directors of the Green Web Foundation, uh, which is an NGO set up to basically speed the transition of the internet away from fossil fuels. Uh, so we have an entirely fossil free internet by 2030. I'm also one of the organizers of climateaction.tech, which is a relatively large online community of climate concerned and climate active techies. And with Michelle Thorne, the co-host on this call, I also am one of the editors of Branch Magazine, which is a magazine for people who dream of a sustainable internet. In the very, very short time I have with you, we're gonna cover these three things here. We're gonna talk about um, a fossil free internet, talk about gold as a way to uh, internalize these ideas and then open as a lever against climate delay. Now we talk about uh, a fossil free internet partly because there's a moral case, but there's also a very, very strong economic case these days now because the renewables have basically got so cheap and so plentiful that this is, is not, not, not really a matter of um, if this happens, it's a case of when this happens. But because we're in a climate emergency, we really, really need to speed this up. And I think there are two things that we might do, because when, if you, when you speak to scientists and you hear what scientists say, they use phrases to describe the kind of action we might need. They talk about um, rapid, far reaching, unprecedented terms. And when scientists say these terms, that's a uh, very, very concern. That's really, really, that's their version of jumping up and down and screaming at us to get on with this. And uh, I think there are two ways that you can kind of act on this uh, and one, two ways that we kind of think about this. So we are concerned my primarily, our NGO is with the greening of the internet itself. So we talk about engaging as professionals, embedding these values in how we work so that we lead with values first. Uh, but there's also another, and you can also talk about engaging as a member of society. And the second half of this talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. But first of all, I'll talk about how we embed these ideas as professionals in how we work. We use this phrase called gold, which stands for green, open, lean, and distributed. And I'll run through examples of how we do this and uh, in embodying these ideas uh, when we work as climate aware technologists. So green, as you'd imagine, is green energy and green material inputs. And um, it takes energy and uh, there is climate pollution caused by running computers because the internet is the largest fossil powered machine in the world. But because computers are basically sand that we've taught to think uh, uh, by, by applying lots of energy, there's a carbon footprint there as well. So the thing I should probably share with you is, is that when you work with fossil energy, we, we are basically arguing for moving to, to use as much green energy as possible and powering all our services. And uh, the reason we want to do this is because even though we know that we can't control everything ourselves and let's say when you're running, a, you, you can't really run a website on solar panels only, uh, we do know that by getting people to invest large amounts of uh, money into renewables, you can eventually like shift things across so that you end up with a greener grid for everyone over time. And this is one thing we campaign for. Um, we, over the last 10 years, have been tracking 
which websites run on renewables and which ones don't uh, to kind of basically make this easy so people can either like shop accordingly or write this into how they procure and do stuff like that. And we release these, these data sets as open data so they can be surfaced by others. And uh, an example of this is website carbon. So you can check a website to see roughly what the carbon emissions are from that website. And you'll see at the bottom, you'll, you'll see where something shows this is showing as bog standard energy. Um, we basically provide that data. So even though we show something ourselves, we increase our reach by using open as a lever for some degree of change. We also talk about open because it's uh, useful in lots of other areas. Uh, and when I say open, I don't just mean open source because transparency and open data is a kind of wider movement as you well know. But this is a good example. If you are thinking about the environmental impact of where you might be used deploying the technology, uh, a lot of it is gonna come from the fact that running, uh, they, they're using servers use lots of energy. So things like say electricity maps show where in the world you might choose to run servers for the greenest possible power. And this is using open data from various parts of the world and then packaged up into a relatively nice, easy to use API. And large numbers of companies are now using this kind of information to basically reduce the environmental impact of the infrastructure they use for when for any of their digital services they have. Uh, we also took about lean as part of gold. So optimizing the way you work for carbon emissions. And I showed you one example of websites, but um, there's also a footprint from the actual gadgets and tools we use right now. And this chart uh, from Nokia's own digital footprint report shows some of this, where essentially there is a carbon footprint from energy, but there's also a carbon footprint from making things. And here open is also um, a, um, a useful lever. There are now a real shift to have some more kind of open laptops and open tools, which extend uh, through extended life start, uh, uh, lifespan end up with lower emissions on a kind of per year basis, basically. And this is a bit like the Fairphone idea, the ideas for the Fairphone that apply to laptops now. So this is one other option. Then finally, we talk about distributed, as in choosing to run the, the, the move work, as you can see, through, 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 through time and space to, to, to avoid carbon emissions. Now, this sounds really, really showy, but it's not really. Like an example we spoke about before was running computer jobs in different parts of the world or using different regions if you use a cloud provider. One option is basically timing the work you do or timing the use of power to have a lower carbon footprint. And in the UK, people use open data to basically green how they bake by waiting for it to, there to be lots of renewables on the grid before they start baking cakes. And uh, this is an idea that we actually use ourselves uh, when we build websites now. So Branch Magazine is a magazine that Michelle and I are editors of. And when there's loads of green energy on the grid, we show a high kind of full fat version of the website. But when uh, the, the grid is gonna be dirtier, we show a kind of lighter kind of lower carbon version by sending just only what we need to send over the wire as an example of like embedding these values in how we work. And the reason I talk about these values, I'll get to in a second, but this is it basically green, gold. So green, open, lean and distributed. This is an example of applying it as a professional uh, technologist, but there are other levers that we have available. And this is probably what we might talk about more in this time. Uh, there's loads of other people putting, uh, showing up to do the work. And in many ways that's because, well, public opinion is shifting. We might have words like predatory delay entering our lexicon now, which is used to describe how large fossil fuel companies are basically slowing down the climate action that we know is absolutely necessary these days. And uh, yes, we're doing some of this work ourselves, but like basically so are loads and loads of people who are too young to really kind of vote or exert too much control themselves. So this is like Fridays for the Future. They turn up every Friday to basically ask us to work harder on this and move because they don't have access to this power themselves. And uh, this is one thing they do, but they also, them, them, them kind of shifting discourse is actually really useful for us because it paves a way for us to use things like the law to buttress this shift in discourse, shift in opinion. And uh, you can see examples of this. In Germany, we had uh, Lisa Neubauer, who's a little bit like the kind of German equivalent of Greta, for example, Greta Thunberg. Her and a number of children have been working with other campaigning groups to create like an evidence base to put towards, say, like the Supreme Court. And they were able to win some you know, landmark climate decisions to basically change Germany's trajectory uh, in, in terms of basically getting to net zero. 
they were able to get the laws changed to force the fourth largest economy on earth to bring forward their target for net zero by five years. So just a handful of children are able to do this kind of stuff. But we're also seeing these kind of tactics working elsewhere. So in May, and you'll see like these happy faces here who are from Milieu Defense, which is a little bit, which is basically their organization who are somewhat like the kind of Dutch equivalent to Friends of the Earth or Greenpeace. They were able to successfully sue Shell, the oil company, and uh, win a landmark ruling, which basically got, which basically meant that the Supreme Court has said to a massive oil company, we are legally compelling you to change your entire corporate strategy and bring it in line with the Paris Agreement to get to net zero by this time. We didn't know this was even possible. And this is actually an example of building an evidence, evidence base and, make, and winning these arguments. And these arguments here are based entirely around things like human rights and protecting the rights of children and people who will be alive for longer. And the thing, this is what I want to point you to. I think that one thing we can do in the world of open, yes, you can do things with technology, but I think there's real scope to share some of the tactical wins or see where cases are being won in certain places and apply them elsewhere. And there are tools like say, these kind of databases that I show you here, the climate change law database that allows us to see where wins can be replicated in other places to actually start essentially winning more quickly because we are starting to win these cases but we're really, really late in the day. And right now, speed is justice. So this is, what, this is what I'd share with you. I think that's all I have time for. So I'll hand over back to Michelle. But if you do want to uh, find out more about what we do, this is the Green Web Foundation. My name is Mr. Chris Adams. And if you're looking for a group of other people to speak to online, climateaction.tech is a really good community for that. And Michelle, I'm gonna hand over to you because I think that's my time used up. All right, thanks everyone. Amazing, thank you so much, Chris. That was a really, really welcomed um, overview and, and really great specific ideas for action. So thank you all the people for been taking notes. Um, we wanted to appreciate the people's times who are here and the chance to kind of um, digest and reflect what Chris says and also bring, I'm sure your own experiences and insights and questions to this. So we're going to do a small group discussions. Um, we're gonna be going into breakout groups in a moment where we have some prompts um, that you can find in the Google Doc that help to maybe reflect and unpack. Um, and then we, can do, we would invite you maybe first to do a little bit of silent writing. I, at least I find in Zoom land, sometimes it helps just to have things quiet and write for a moment. Uh, and then we can maybe talk amongst the group and we'll be coming back to as a larger group to maybe share some of the you know, things that really stuck out with you and we'll then wrap up the call from there. So, um, while Shannon prepares our amazing breakout, uh, breakout room uh, <laughs> button, um, some of the questions we're thinking you might want to ask um, is, where else could openness be used to change the status quo, especially towards a fossil-free internet? Um, what are other open practices and assets that exist that could help transition the internet to renewables? And what actions speak to you personally? And who else is doing relevant work? And who else should be in these conversations? And then the wild card, any other reflections or questions or ideas that um, that, that sparked for you? Um, so Shannon, when you're ready, we might then um, break into our groups and be in that first few minutes of silent writing and then discussion and come back in 15 minutes. That sounds Great. all right for people. Yep, and it looks like we'll go into five different rooms. I'm just going to assign them automatically. So we'll have a little bit of a roulette to see who you end up with. Um, if you get lost in Zoom, uh, send me a message and I will help you figure out how to not be lost. Thank you. Okay. All right, you all should be ready to go. Okay, sorry for interrupting there, done. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for the great typing and discussing. Um, so for the next bit, I mean, definitely feel free to capture those last great ideas. Uh, don't want to lose them. Um, but we wanted to do maybe just to go around to each group and just um, share some of the highlights that came out of your discussion and reflections. Maybe you didn't get a chance to answer all the questions. That's OK. You didn't get a chance to even synthesize your ideas. That's also OK. Um, this is just a sense to get to hear what, what was resonating with people or what other questions came up. Um, so with that, maybe we'll go to group one. Is there someone from group one who'd like to share what you all talked about and what you're taking away?
You may also not remember your group number. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. Like, Alex was distracting me. Like, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, um, so um, we, we actually uh, share a lot of interesting things. Um, and um, someone actually said, you know, I think the questions are very open. So I'm going to, like, pose these new questions to you folks. And um, that included asking ourselves, what is exactly the definition of internet that we are using uh, for this conversation. And um, uh, that could include either the community internet or the um, internet based on big companies or the internet, um, the, deep dark, the deep dark internet that is doing uh, Bitcoin mining. Um, which one of those um, are the internets that we're talking about? Um, and I think that that uh, gave us a lot of room to have a very interesting conversation around the value gap, um, around those different definitions of the internet and how we could actually inspire or track or make some action around some of these issues, uh, starting from uh, the very big companies to the community, um, the internet, um, the community-based um, internet. Um, and I hope I sort of captured uh, what folks were discussing, but uh, feel free to, you know, jump and say, I think that you didn't cover this point. Papa, I think I'm going to ask James if we can ask him. We've got a next generation uh, um, weighing in. So, um, I don't know if we're able to mute you, Chris. Sorry about that. Or Chris Lepern. Um, someone from group two, would you like to share um, what you all talked about? I can try. <laughs> yes, go um, for it, Amelia. We, ha we had like a, a very uh, divergent conversation, which was really nice. Uh, but I think the main takeaway um, was a comment I think that Marcela had that was about us as members of society are looking for prompts on how to uh, make, do action. And, and I think it's part of our work in developing a cleaner, more sustainable internet to help give others those prompts and telling them, this is what you should be doing, right? So, uh, and, I, and I think it's important to, to believe uh, that everyone's expecting to know what to do and how to uh, move forward and how to take action. And thank you really for reporting on group two from group two. Is there someone from group three who'd like to share? If not, no worries. We will we will read. Actually, it was really re enjoying people's comments and stuff in there. So if no one from group three wants to share them out loud, we could go to group four. Hi, this is Karin, and I have been volunteered. <laughs> um, the, the group was very earnestly typing, and so there's lots of notes there. And then really for me, the big takeaway question was, well, what are hosting companies doing? Why aren't they just all kind of immediately jumping on this band bandwagon? And then we realized, well, we're not entirely sure whether they are jumping on this bandwagon. And so we realized that actually, apart from people who make decisions about hosting services very particularly in a corporate way, we don't really have enough information about that. Um, certainly not as an, an end user. And then Chris of the delightful interlude um, kind of, described a little bit about how decision-making happens in the company that he's with, and actually how many complex moving parts there are in making decisions about these things, and how even for people who run hosting services, then the people who they rely on for infrastructure is still to a large extent a black box. And so there are all these different little bit of moving parts that you think should be an easy decision, but actually it turns out that it's not. And then that, for me, compounds that decision is, are there trade-offs to be made with things like security, for instance? 
Lots of people are talking about geographies in which you host. Should you be hosting somewhere else? Um, but then if you make that security decision, what does that look like for your fossil fuel or your energy decisions? And what, how, how important are those trade-offs trade -offs and at which point? Because the important part of this is that this is really a, a moving living beast and it's going to continuously evolve and that's what we want because we want to change from one um, static position to another one, but in that there's going to be lots of toing and throwing in different points at which things happen and how can we find a, a, a better roadmap for that and better tools to figure out what does that look like oh brilliant recap thank you i i really appreciate the questions that you all raised and, and that summary uh, amazing group four thank you uh group five would you like to share what you all discussed i i can share a little bit um and this maybe touches on some of what's already been said. Uh, but what came up for me in thinking about this is something that I've been struggling with for about 10 years in the open movement, which is that I think the concept of open as a strategy is a little incomplete, um, especially when we're dealing with large, powerful systems or large, you know, large, powerful structures. Um, uh, for example, one tactic that recently came up um, uh, in the open software community that I observed was you know, someone advocating to do something similar to what's just been done in the advertising industry with the clean creatives campaign, where they basically said, you know, all advertising companies should blacklist extractive companies and not and refuse to make media for them. Um, and this was a somewhat different angle, but it was like, you had a software developer saying we should change open source licenses to forbid the use of this software from by extractive companies um, and the reception to this idea which seems to me like worth exploring was pretty universally negative and hostile from the open source world um, and i can't really comment on like the intricacies of of licensing maybe this particular idea wasn't a good one but it, it seemed really clear that like people who are steeped in this idea of openness were like we can't set boundaries around who can use this um, which I've seen show up elsewhere where it's like, if you're trying to build power and value um, in other contexts, it is understood that you do need to create boundaries. You need to exclude some people. You need to say what is allowed and what isn't. And in the open world, it seems like there's a culture that resists that, that essentially work, that conceptual and, and community-based work of determining what is and isn't allowed. And, and I guess that's a question that I have for this group is like, you know, is that a is that a, a conversation worth having in this context? Uh, awesome provocation. There's some there's some good head nodding here, which may be then a nice time actually to open it up to like the larger group if you'd like to. Maybe we'll give ourselves like five or so minutes to respond um, to what people have said or anything that's come up for you. Um, feel free to unmute or raise your hand with the little emoji hand that's here. Um, if you'd like to, to weigh in. And bye, Sarah, thank you for joining me. Uh, Chris, would you like to, to respond first? I, th I actually agree with what Greg has said. And one, one thing we discussed was this notion of recourse, like you need more than just having open as, an, as a lever because, and this is why, why I was pointing to other people using this power because if you don't have a real kind of think, idea of who's likely to be using the power, then yeah, you could have all these unintended side effects. So I think the there's there's countless examples of people just opening things up without thinking who's a, who who's enabled who's enabled first, or even thinking about how do you make it accessible or more easy to use than uh, for particular groups or be, be a bit more I guess aware of how you expect it to be used, perhaps to kind of uh, set some kind of expected uses or at least uh, be communicate these kind of values. Thank you for that. Uh, Diego, you also had your hand up. Yes, so I'm very excited actually about what you were saying, Greg. Um, I'm going to speak as a we, a software developer actually, we're like so guilty about all this stuff. So software development specifically open source, right? It has like a big issue is that we're open to one side only. So open source normally is actually open to the side of the companies, right? 
And the reason for that is because the people that are actually like paying for the open source labor, right? Are actually the larger companies that are benefiting from actually reselling their software package in a different way, right? So this licensing issue is actually affecting people's livelihood, right? And because open source communities are not necessarily open in every aspect, right? It's like they're open source, but maybe they're not agreeing on like climate change. And many of them are actually making side money on like generating like NFTs or like Bitcoin right? mining, right? Uh, where I'm very guilty into that. Uh, I wanted to actually use like, I like analogies here. It's like uh, one of the big issues where we can actually as software developers attack and like this, this problem with like global warming is actually making better practices on what, how we code things, right? Right now, uh, the code that we're producing, right, is extremely redundant. And we're overusing the power that the machines that are driving that, right, really need. And one of the things I would like notice that we're like really not recycling, right, uh, old practices where we're like limited in power of the computers, right? So we're building software for the newer machines that require a lot of energy, right? But we used to actually do good things 10 or 20 years ago with less power, right? Um, it's a political issue because the people producing the devices, right, are giving us more power. And a tiny phone on your hand has more power right now than a server 20 years ago, right? Or 10 years ago, even, right? So because software is the brain of the machines that are actually using the energy, I think this is a good start. It's like, if we want to make a change about openness, it's actually open software to the community on one side, making it more clear, right? Because it's, it's open also like, it's close knowledge, right? but also like being open about our practices and sharing these practices with the world, which includes, for example, remove automatic testing from every pull request that you make. When you're making changes in code, hundreds of tiny computers are spinning just to test your code. When you already have a, com a computer at home that can do that and it's already turned on, right? Political statement here, sorry. <laughs> no, that's and okay. I appreciate that <laughs> No, I really appreciate the points you're bringing up. Um, and I, there was a lot of also, yeah, <laughs> looked like uh, agreements and head nodding. I wanted to open the floor if there's anyone who else who wanted to add. We have like a few more minutes to discuss if you have another question or reflection. Um, provocation. I think we have Matt with your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, and scan. We'll do Matt and scan and <laughs> to bring us home. All right. Now, I just I, I like that I you know exploring the um, you know because all of this is is political. I, I mean, I just regretfully that's just how it is in, in the, the world that we live in. And um, like and you know I, I I I'm kind of interested just in the first lot of time I thought about it was, was just mentioned the idea of having maybe you know even a new you have you know open open source, but do you have community software that has more structures around it that, you know, we're, no, we're building this for, um, for people, not for corporations. And I know that's going, getting a little, um, a little afar from kind of just the environmental side of things, but, you know, just, have, but the, you know, community is so important when it comes to environmental issues and uh, energy issues. So I'm, I just want to say that I'm, in, I, I'm intrigued by that. I'm not a. Um, I don't know nearly as much about uh, programming as probably most of the people on here. But that that idea of licensing is, is a really interesting um, potential mechanism to get to a more community based um, open uh, program and software. Oh, cool! Thank you, Matt. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Scan. You'll be you'll be our last question slash comment, and then we'll we'll wrap up the call. No, I'm, I'm glad that Matt has just brought that a comment, right? I think that one of the things that we have been exploring in this calls, um, even when uh, today's call uh, facilitated by Chris was all around like the internet in more of the like hardware machine infrastructure uh, sense. Um, we have also been discussing a lot about like the open communities, like Wikipedia, Wikimedia movement, and you know, all the open licensing folks. And I think that there are differences there between the open software uh, movement and the open culture, so to speak, movement. Um, and so I think it's it's good that in a way, um, I feel that what Diego is bringing is very important because it's like, oh, let's focus also in the practices that are more around how do we build or, um, you know, or 
things. <laughs> Be it like a large collaborative encyclopedia or um, uh, uh, software. Yeah, thank you for helping me remind that, yeah, that this, the, the perspectives we've also been talking about just about open source in the software sense, but in, in culture and other practices and data and beyond. Um, nice. All right, well, we're, we're moving into the, Karen, okay, Karen, I see your hand. You get to squeeze in as the last comment, go for it, and then we'll, we'll close out the day. No, it's just, I was reminded about this, this idea of doing things uh, collaboratively and building on top of open, you know, we, we speak a lot about releasing things openly, but we don't really speak that much about reusing things that are open. And maybe if everybody didn't build their own thing every time, that would also be one of the ways in which we could reduce our energy usage. And so the, the open part for me is just, is not just how we as creators behave in terms of how, what we release openly, but how we as creators and consumers think about what can we reuse and what can we build upon rather than continuing to recreate in different uh, corners of the internet. Yeah, the, it's funny how the recycling meant a reduce, reuse, recycle still soon has like it might apply here. <laughs> um, amazing. Um, Chris Adams, I might turn it to you if you want, if, I'm, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but if you wanted to have any sort of a concluding word, because uh, you shared that br brilliant uh, presentation or any other thoughts um, to close us out with. I think, um, okay. Uh, the thing I wish I'd said previously that is in the chat and probably not captured for the recording is that when we talk about any like decarbonizing in any industry, ultimately all this stuff is about power not necessarily energy and who you're choosing to enable and you can quite easily have a kind of closed very very oppressive green internet right not sure that's what we want which is why it's important to talk about uh, open in some ways as like open plus recourse or open in the context of there being some effective and functioning governance and thinking about how it can actually be used rather than just sharing it for sharing sake, even though in some cases when there's already asymmetry, it can help. I think that's the thing I'll probably just run round off with. It's about power, not just energy, as the thing for, I'd like everyone to take away with them. Yep, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Brilliant, thank you. Um, well, thank you all for the excellent discussion and comments and uh, provocations. Um, this is concluding our our August uh, open climate call. We're what we're gonna what we're gonna do. We're from here is um, we're gonna take the kind of transcripts and notes from this call and turn it into a more public uh, um, facing kind of summary, which you'll find on the wiki and whenever as as soon as we're able to do that. Um, there will be another call that's wrapping up our pilot series in September on the twenty eighth, same time, probably same zo same Zoom channel. Um, that's going to be hosted by Shannon. Um, and Shannon, I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you'd like to give a teaser about that call, or we can say it's going to be amazing and cumulative and taking us forward from uh, where open climate should could and should go. <laughs> um, well, I would just like ahead. to say, as Matt prefaced, um, Neuralinians are a bit distracted at the moment. My hope was to be able to get you a call topic um, as of last Friday. It hasn't happened yet. Um, however, uh, if there are folks on this call, especially after this one, um, that have a topic that you feel like is really compelling, uh, we're very open to hosting a call around it. Um, and also seeing Matt on here, uh, Matt, sorry to put you on the spot, but Matt has worked with Healthy Golf for years, and um, I know him a bit in that context. Um, I might be really interested in bringing in uh, folks that are doing community organizing, because um, we haven't had a lot of those yet, uh, to see if we can have a conversation about what open and the open movement can do to support the work that y'all are doing. So Matt, I may be reaching out to you. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'd be happy to help out with that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, we might have a topic. <laughs> awesome. And a huge thank you and hearts out to uh, you know, New Orleanians. Um, thank you for making the time to be on the call, even yeah, despite everything that's going on. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for making the time to be here and for sharing your thoughts and your um, ideas. I really appreciate uh, you and I hope to see you in September and in the meanwhile on an increasingly fossil free internet. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.
Thank you all. Got to run, but looking forward to discussing.